Hi there everyone, uh, I'm Andy Bailey. Uh, welcome to our family guide to bird watching this morning. I hope you're all well and uh, enjoying this sort of nicer, warmer weather that we've got at the minute. And this morning we're joined by one of Dartmoor's best loved naturalists and wildlife artist, John Walters, uh, who you've probably seen on TV, on lots of programmes, on things like The One Show and countless wildlife programmes, looking at our local wildlife all around here um, I've got him just uh, behind the scenes, uh, waiting uh, to introduce him uh, in just a few moments. But before we do that, I'll just do a few of the basic housekeeping things uh, associated with this event today. Uh, so I just want to remind you that because this is a family friendly event, uh, we've no live chat today. But if you do want to get in touch, you can email us at education at dartmoor.gov.uk and I've already got a few questions in so thank you to those people who've sent those in already. If you do want to send us a question uh, do so through the through this broadcast uh, and we'll put them to John at the end of the talk that he's going to do for us. Uh, so as I say thank you for joining us this morning. I mean it has been rather grey and wet hasn't it, over the last few days and weeks and it's been cold and everything but this last week uh, the bird life has really started to sort of ramp up and I, just on my short walks in the mornings I've noticed a lot more bird life where I live and it's just a great time to be out and about exploring stuff. Uh, so uh, this is this week is part of National uh, National Nest Box Week and so we've had our attentions turned to all manner of bird related things. So if you go on YouTube you'll be able to find a bird box making film with Stuart, one of our rangers. Uh, Rebecca's made some uh, pancakes, some birdie pancakes to feed them uh, yesterday and today we've got John who's going to do a beginner's guide to family bird watching. Uh, so, uh, so today, uh, yeah, we're going to take everything to the next level. We've got plenty of tips and ideas to share with you how to improve your observation and identification skills. So I'm really pleased uh, to be able to welcome our guest this morning. Uh, so let's welcome uh, John, who's waiting uh, behind the scenes here. I'm just going to uh, bring him in. Hi, John. How are you doing? All right. Yeah, great. Thank you. It's great to have you with us this morning. Uh, uh, really looking forward to uh, finding out a bit more about uh, about sort of all your tips and tricks for us today. Uh, so uh, for everyone else, I'm going to be sort of uh, dropping off the screen for a minute. I'm going to go behind the scenes and make sure that all the buttons and technical stuff work uh, just in case uh, there's any issues and things I'll also be looking out for questions uh, as well so I'll make sure I bring those to John uh, in the uh, at the end of the session uh, so if I just hand over to you John I'm going to make you go uh, full size I think here and then uh, you can take it away and then uh, go on with the talk that'd be fantastic thank you John welcome this morning to this uh, guide to bird watching uh, the talk will last about three quarters of an hour and in that time I'll give you a brief introduction to myself and then I'll take you through some of the ways to actually uh, begin bird watching and, and explore the world of birds in, in, in this country. So to start with I live just on the south side of Dartmoor at Buckfast Lee. I originally come from Haining Island in Hampshire, uh, grew up there and then I went to college down at Falmouth uh, Art College down in Cornwall. And I ended up working for the Arnold National Park Authority for several years. Uh, in uh, went there in 1990. Uh, I now work as a, a freelance ecologist. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. Um, my real passion in life is observing wildlife and particularly drawing and painting and taking photographs of wildlife. So this is me out in the garden uh, sketching some bees, some wool carder bees. Uh, I always, uh, I'll talk a little bit about more about how I draw later on in the talk, but uh, I use just a few few paints, a, a limited palette of, of, of watercolour paints and pencils, and I like to go out, out in the field and actually draw things on the spot from life. I'll talk about that a bit later. There's a, a drawing of some comma butterflies. Now I use these illustrations in a variety of ways, so I produce a little uh, nature a wildlife sketchbook section in the Dartmoor magazine in each issue. This is one on swifts, and I'll talk about swifts later on. 
and I produce a number of cards from my uh, uh, field sketches. So I, I don't ever draw and paint indoors. I always draw and paint outside. So these are all drawings and paintings, trying to capture the life of the subjects that I'm uh, looking at. So there's a cuckoo up in the right there and some bullfinches, and they'll appear in this talk as well. As well as that, I work as an ecologist, particularly studying insects. It's one of my specialist subjects. This is me out on the A38 in uh, uh, just between Ivy Bridge and uh, my home in Buckersley, uh, uh, doing a survey of some of the insects which live on the road verges. And I've also been recently studying the one of the well, one of the UK's rarest ants, the narrow-headed ant, which lives at Chudley Night and Heath and nowhere else now in England. It survives at a few places in Scotland, but we're in a project trying to re-establish it to some of its old sites. I use a, a number of cameras for taking my photographs. I used to use an old Sony Handycam at the back there. I don't tend to use that anymore, but I, these days I use a, a Canon SX well, 70 I use now, that's a 50 on there, uh, bridge camera, which has a good zoom lens, which I can use for taking pictures of birds, and a little Olympus Tuck camera, which is very useful for taking pictures of insects, and also you can put it underwater. So I've got lots of frogs in our ponds at the moment, so I've been putting it actually in the pond with the frogs to get some pictures of those. I've worked on, as Andy said, a number of television programmes over the years. Uh, this is working with David Attenborough about 10, 15 years ago now, on a series called Life in the Undergrowth, where I had to get various bugs to sit still while David Attenborough did some uh, talking about them. And I've also done quite a few little short films for the one show. This is one on some grasshoppers down at Branscombe in East Devon, the Rufus Grasshopper. And I think that's available online. There are some links to some of these films on my website, which I'll give you details of at the end. So birds. I mean, birds really are one of the most familiar creatures if you go out you know get up in the morning open the door open the window whatever go out for a walk the wildlife you most likely to see it, it is a bird you know they they're all over the place and they generally live around us and they're quite obvious most of them uh, live come out in the daytime so they're up they have the same sort of routine as us they get up have the breakfast and then they pot around during the daytime and sleep at night so they're familiar things and they also a lot of them have got used to living and actually uh, coming around our houses, particularly if we feed them. Now, birds are actually really a kind of dinosaur, really, when it comes to it. They, birds evolved from dinosaurs, and really they are, in a way, dinosaurs. Some things like the cassowary they're down in Australia. I mean, to me, that really it looks like a dinosaur still. Uh, but some of the earliest fossils, about 150 million years ago, uh, were of uh, toothed birds, but they had feathers. And that's the distinctive thing, really, about birds. All birds have feathers. So uh, they're the only creatures that have that, but they are they are dinosaurs, really. They're the only living relatives of the dinosaurs. There have been some huge ones around over the years. This is a terror bird. Luckily, it's extinct now. <laughs> I don't think it would probably is about as uh, tall as me, um, and uh, quite a ferocious looking thing. But these are at one point birds were one of the top predators uh, in the in the animal kingdom. So they grew to enormous sizes, and you can see this is quite a formidable creature. So in Britain, we've, uh, there's been about 20 odd species of bird ever recorded in Britain, which is quite a lot. Um, 250 of these are seen regularly. So there's quite a number of those birds which uh, just turn up now and again. And uh, just over 200 nest in the UK. So uh, there's, you know, when you're talking about birds that you see in your garden, you probably see maybe in a good year, maybe 30 or 40 species if you're lucky uh, in your local area. Um, but uh, if you have to go much, much more widely afield to find some of the other birds, and to see 619, you're going to be an you know, obsessive twitcher, really, and it's uh, and travel all over the country looking for particularly rare birds. So birds have uh, different statuses, really. So there's some resident birds, and, and the classic resident bird is the house sparrow. Um, house sparrows generally don't travel very far in their lifetime. Um, they'll nest in a particular spot and they'll probably move, you know, maybe a mile or so uh, during their lifetime. So the one, the house sparrows that live in your garden will be, or in the local park, will be there all, all their lives. But other birds, you know, are migrant birds, and the classic ones are things like swallows, which, and cuckoos and house martins, which 
um, the classic, what people think of as the migrant birds, which fly down to Africa to spend the winter, and then they come back in the spring, and then they breed here in the spring and summer, and then in the autumn they fly back to Africa. So they're the, they're the migrant birds, and, and the classic, real classic bird is the, the nest where I live in Buckfastley and other towns around the moor is the swift, and the swift nests in, uh, it's very much associated with people. Now it used to nest on cliffs and, and just like that, but now almost exclusively nests in on houses and particularly under the eaves of roofs, uh, where it can just tuck in there. It doesn't actually make a nest really. It just nests just inside under the roof tiles and it has tiny little legs so it can hardly walk. And this bird is, is the most aerial bird in the world. It, it actually, when it leaves the nest, it only ever lands when it's nesting. When it leaves in August, they leave in early August um, time from, from here, and they've, they don't ever stop flying. They sleep on the wing, and they fly all this way down to South Africa, um, middle of Africa, down to Southern Africa, and then they'll fly back and they'll arrive back in usually almost bang on the 1st of May they come back. So it's the amazing. So at the moment, all the swifts that live around Dharma are flying around over Africa somewhere. They, in a few weeks' time, they'll head back. Other birds, like the red wing, uh, don't breed that commonly in Britain. You do get the old pair breed in Scotland. But uh, they're generally they're a winter visitor. So they these birds come from Scandinavia, from places like Norway and Sweden. And then they these birds fly over here to spend the winter here because it's a bit milder here. Uh, and uh, not so frozen up as the as it is where they breed. So these birds don't move as far as the swallows and swifts, but they move a fair distance. And these birds come over the North Sea and spend the winter in Britain. Now, the red wing is one of the commonest birds in Britain in the winter, but it's a shy bird and it usually lives out in the woods and fields. And so you don't generally see them. Um, this one came into our garden to uh, feed on the berries of our cotoneaster. So if you have berry bushes like this, uh, you may well attract birds like the red wing. Birds even that you may think of, of resident, and some of them are birds like the robin, um, they also, they some of them stay, live and breed here all the time, but others will actually migrate here from, again, places like Sweden and Norway, and they'll come across the and um, spend the winter here, then go back in the spring. So it's migration is quite difficult to, you know, pinpoint a, a particular bird and say what it does because individuals of the same species will, depending on where they live, will do different things. So starlings are another bird which will breed here. Then some breed in Buckfastly here where I live. Starlings fly over from Eastern Europe and they spend the winter in Britain and then they'll fly back in March time to breed, you know, in places like Serbia and, and places like that, Romania, these birds come from. Um, if you ever get a chance to go and see a starling roost, I'll just play a little video here. It's one of the most amazing things you can see in nature, and it's something you, know, you can see in Britain, um, certainly when we're allowed out anyway, to go to places. This is on Bodmin Moor, um, but there are other big roosts. Uh, sometimes there's a roost at Oakhampton Camp on the north side of Dartmoor, um, and there's a big roost at Ham Wall on the Somerset Levels on the RSPB Reserve up there. So. Um, I thoroughly recommend, if, you have, if you've never done it, going out to see a starling roost. Uh, other birds aren't native to Britain, but they do. They are reasonably common here. This one, of the, one is the mandarin duck. This was originally imported from China to, for wildflower collections in about 150 years ago now. And some of them have escaped and they've got out into the countryside and they, and they do well, actually, particularly around the, the rivers. There's a river. Um, water duck really, but it also it nests in trees, so it actually nests in holes in trees. This is the mandarin duck, quite a small duck, um, but reasonably common around the edges of Dartmoor, they start from the river Dart. And birds like the pheasant as well, which is again is introduced from Asia, um, mainly for uh, shooting, um, but uh, they've of course they've escaped and they, they're breeding out in the countryside, but it's not a native British bird. Other birds are of that big list of birds, of birds which are, are rare, but they do turn up every year. This is a, a rose-coloured starling, um, and a few of these will appear each year in Britain. So they're sort of a regular, um, sort of semi-migrant to Britain. They, they turn up here. And other birds are in, just incredibly rare that get blown across the, the channel, uh, the uh, Atlantic, I mean. The, the, this is an American catbird, which turned up in 
the west of Cornwall near Land's End. This had been blown all the way across by a hurricane across the Atlantic and then turned up in Britain. And then other birds, this is uh, one that turned up at Dawlish Warren many years ago called a long-billed murrelet. And that's the only one that's ever been seen in Britain. So there's only one individual uh, of that bird seen in this country. So if you want to identify birds, I mean, really, there's a lot of information online. It's good to have a bird book to refer to. One of the most popular books, a real good starter book, is the RSPB Handbook of British Birds. So it is handy having a book that you can um, take out with you if you're going out for a walk or you know, just um, have around the house and just have a flick through. It just gets you familiar with, with the birds you're likely to see. Or if you see something unusual, you can try and look it up. Uh, there's a lot of the RSPB have got a lot of information online as well about um, birds or pretty well all the birds you're likely to see. There'll be a, a page on their website. So if you have a look there, uh, you can find more information. And these are the books. If you get more into bird watching, these are the books I use uh, for bird watching. The Birds of Europe by Lars Johnson and the Collins Bird Guide. And this is uh, more of serious bird watching. And it's probably a little bit confusing for for beginners, because there's everything in there that occurs in Europe. Um, but if you get more serious into bird watching, books like this are, are essential, really. And as well as that, there's a lot of other information out there. So there's, you, know, you pick these up in the library or, or buy a copy. There's the Birds of Devon, and uh, there's also a book on the Birds of Dartmoor, and the Devon Bird Report. And this gives you an idea, if you look through these, of the sort of birds that we're likely to get in, in Devon. Which, and this does help enormously when you're trying to identify anything. If you look it up in your book and, um, and, then, it, and then have a look in, in, in a book like this, you can, if you've got a particular species and then you look it up in here and you, you see it's something which is common in Devon, then you're likely to have made the identification correctly. If it's something which hasn't been recorded in Devon, uh, it's probably unlikely that you've got the identification right. Uh, bird feeders are the... Uh, Probably the first or the, the best way really to see birds closely. Uh, you can either have if you've got one in, if you've got one in your garden, you get birds like these are some long tail tips coming in to feed on the feeder. This is actually just in town here in Buckersley. Uh, someone set up some feeders near the cave, uh, the cave centre, and uh, the long tail tips come down to feed there. Um, but you know, really having a feeder or something close to the that you can put in the garden just see you can actually see them um, the tricky thing with birds is actually seeing them you know getting close because uh, if you're out for a walk in the countryside they're quite they can be quite elusive and distance um, so it is it's trying to get close and see them this is a, a squirrel proof uh, bird uh, feeder this is down at Mansands, it's down near Brixham there's a little nature reserve there and they have a little hide and that's a good place sort of place to go um, on a reserve where they've got a feeder and in the winter you can go and sit in the hide and get really close views and that's the, a good way to actually learn how to identify birds by actually being able to see them properly um, and the, this is an ideal one these bullfinches were just a few feet away from me and I was sat in the hide. Now I use, now, I use a, a pair of binoculars now if you if you're going out bird watching you know, in the woodlands and out on the moor a lot of the birds that they're a bit more frightened of you, really, and they're sort of way out. So a pair of binoculars is really essential. And if you're down on the estuary uh, looking for birds, particularly on the mudflats, I use a telescope for, for watching them. I also use these for when I'm drawing as well. So this is a, a guide I produce for the Buckfastley Wild Watch Group. I just produced this a few weeks ago. So this is, a, a, again, it's another example of a, a, a guide which shows you, that gives you a list of the birds and shows you the pictures of the birds which you're likely to see in, a, in an area. So these are the sort of birds you're, you're going to see around if you live in a place like you know, around the town, around Dartmoor. Um, these sort of things you're going to get in your garden or in the surrounding countryside. So this really honed it down rather than having a field guide with hundreds of different species that all look the same. Um, you can have a look on here on a guide like this and you can see which ones you're likely to, get to see in your garden and it just makes identification easier. So some of the familiar things that you'll see start with if you've got feeders, uh, blue tits and great tits and coal tits, things like that. Uh, robins are familiar garden birds, starlings will come down to food and then you get other birds like wrens and dunnocks. If you live near woodland you may attract some woodland birds to your garden 
uh, things like nut hatches and tree creepers will come in. Uh, long tailed tits as well, which live in the woods and gold crests. Uh, blackbirds and song thrushes will come in, particularly if you get very cold weather, it's worth putting out. If you've got some apples, I collect some apples up in the autumn and put them out and uh, then they attract the birds, particularly if it snows because they're really hungry then and they can come in and feed. So you get things like red wings and field pears and blackbirds coming in to feed on that. Uh, seeds, you know, sunflower hearts, niger seeds, that sort of thing will attract uh, various sorts of finches, gold finches, green finches and siskins. Um, and then these are some of the other birds which are a bit more, you know, white in the wider countryside around town here. Uh, things like woodpeckers, which I'll talk about, um, and some of the other ducks and birds which you see on the rivers. A sort of a good place if you, you're venturing out from your garden, you, you want to explore bird watching. It's a good, a good sort of place to go, somewhere like Stover Lake, just on the south side of Dartmoor. Uh, the, the birds, there's lots of people go there, so the birds are tame, so you can get close views of exotic looking birds, like these great crested greaves, which nest there. And also they've got some feeders there too, and also places like Yarna Wood on the moor, and, and many other places have these winter feeders, so you can see birds closely. Uh, these are great spotted woodpeckers, you can sit and hide and get a very close view of those. They're quite exciting when you start out bird watching, seeing these. And also down on the estuary, so this is a bowling green marsh where the, uh, the high day you can sit in the hide and get close views of various wading birds. And also walking along the side of the ex estuary, this is down near turf locks. And uh, you can just looking on the mud flats there. Now, if you're on an estuary, you want to go when the tide is coming in, because obviously the birds are closer in then than miles out in the mud flats. And you can see things like abacets there in the winter time. And this is uh, from down at the height at Dawlish Warren, uh, where there's a, a high tide roost there. And again, as the tide comes up, lots of birds come into roost. So you get little wading birds. These, a lot of these birds breed up in the Arctic. Uh, so things like grey plover there in the front, the red shank, and all the little ones are dunlings. Uh, it's another bird which you, you get in marshes and along the coast here. But it's very, very difficult to see, thing called the jack snipe. Uh, you also get it up on Dartmoor. They, uh, this bird actually breeds in Finland and it comes here for the winter and it's, uh, you have to always tread on it before it flies away. Now, uh, some places you might think uh, you probably wouldn't want to go bird watching, but uh, actually are really good. And the sewage works at Butler's Lee and other places where you get these open pan sewage works like this are amazingly good for birds, particularly in the winter, uh, because there's all these little midges which breed in, this, in the beds there. And they, uh, this is excellent food for birds. So uh, I often have a wander down to the sewage works, particularly when it's cold uh, in this time of year. And you can get really good views of birds like gold crests because they're actually just feeding in the hedge by the side of the of the road there, right by the sewage works, uh, feeding on those little flies. Gold crests, and you might be lucky and see a fire crest there as well. These are some of Britain's smallest birds. I mean, the biggest birds probably things like a newt swan. Uh, but uh, the goldcrest is an absolutely tiny little bird. Um, they're so small, they have to, and they snuggle up together like this to keep warm at night. I saw this for the first time at the weekend. There's always new things to see when you're bird watching. And this is uh, two goldcrests that snuggle up to keep warm at night. So uh, they're so tiny that these birds have to, uh, you know, survive the night, have to keep warm by snuggling up together. And another bird which does this, which I'll show you. At the end of the talk is the long-tailed tit, and that is famous for snuggling up. If you go out in the woodlands, uh, it can, it's particularly, well, any time of year in the woodlands, the birds can be a lot more difficult to see. Um, you may, it's easier actually to hear birds, really, uh, than, than see them in the woodlands. It can take quite a bit of time to see things. But there's lots of birds there, and they're often in, in the winter, they're in little flocks. So, once you find one bird, a group of blue tits or whatever, it's worth waiting around and seeing what else is following them. And you may see a bird like this little tree creeper, but generally they can be quite tricky things to see. Often in the woods, it's worth finding where the food is. So a lot of the birds like birch seeds, so if you can find some birch trees, the bullfinches will feast on these and goldfinches as well. So you might find a particular place where there's a, a food source, a natural food source, which will attract the birds. Uh, just talk a little bit about drawing birds now. This is some of my very early drawings of, of birds. And I used to 
draw from photographs and a little bit from looking out in the field. But now, I, as I said, I always only draw from, from living birds in the light in the field and paint them as well. And that was my first ever attempt at painting a bird outside in 1990. Uh, I've been inspired by various artists, people like Eric Ennion, uh, who's a great artist who, who, who did this. He went out in the field drawing and sketching birds from life and trying to capture the, the life and movement of them. And other people that he influenced, people like John Busby, who wrote this excellent book, Drawing Birds, which is full of good advice if you're interested in drawing birds. Uh, you hold up a copy of this book. And he was particularly keen on seabirds. Uh, you can see these are some gannets on the Bass Rock in Scotland, where he lived. And he loved drawing seabirds sea flying around on the wind. He's a real master at drawing them. And other people like J.A. Shepherd, this was, uh, he lived in the 19th century. He did, but did some very early uh, lively drawings of, of birds, which I really like. And another guy, that's uh, an East Anglian artist, Frank Southgate, again drawing some gulls and common birds, you know, that on the on the beach, but moving around. Uh, uh, Joseph Crawhall, drawing a young rook. And uh, Talbot Kelly, who's a master of line, just very, very simple, just simple ways of painting. So when I'm painting out in the field, I just use uh, a basic kit, uh, which are my paints, anything that all has to fit in my rucksack. So I've got some watercolours, a uh, little paint kit, uh, some pencils, a little telescope here, so I'm probably on the estuary drawing some birds. Um, so it's last night, so I try and get out and draw as much as possible. Even in the winter, I sit outside drawing. These are drawing some pine wagtails uh, roosting down the, at the steam uh, railway at Buckley in the evening. So I was out sketching those last night. And this is a quick time lapse, which I've actually speeded up the version of painting, painted some long tail tips to show how to do this. Uh, all, all done outside, watching the birds and, and painting them on the spot. So this would take about an hour or so, I suppose, to, to do. It's all been speeding up. There we go. So really, as I said, when you're in the woods, it's a matter of trying to uh, hear the bird as much as anything. And bird, learning bird song is a real key thing to do. So if you go out this time of year, as, as Andy said, you might hear this, a little uh, a song thrush singing. Um, and if you want to learn bird song, really, I think this time of year is, is probably the, the best time to start because the birds are just starting to sing. So sort of, once you get into February time, those are starting to sing on mild days and there's not so many to start with. So uh, as, as the season progresses, first of all, you get robins and song thrushes singing and you get things arriving in a few weeks time. We'll get the chiff chaff, which is an easy one to learn because it goes chiff chaff, chiff chaff, chiff chaff. Uh, these arrive from they winter down in the Mediterranean and uh, arrive here in March. And you may hear other birds like a green woodpecker which are quite shy, but you hear they have a distinctive yak or call. And a little tiny woodpecker as well, you might hear drumming, They're often quite tricky to see, as is a tiny lesser spotted woodpecker. Uh, one of the specialities really of the woods around Dartmoor. It's, uh, it's the size of a sparrow, this bird, it's a tiny little thing, and even can hide behind twigs. So it, it's very good at uh, eluding you really, if you, even if you can hear it. But one of the best ways to pick these up is actually by learning what their calls are. And probably the best way to start is there's, there's quite a few guides online. This is one I found from the Woodland Trust, which uh, gives you a guide to some of the common birds and you can play the, the song there of the bird and just learn it. And that's probably the best way to learn how to, to identify bird songs. Don't try and rush it really. It's one of these things, try and learn one one at a time and as I said try and start early in the year so late late January February time because then there aren't so many birds singing there and you tend to be robin singing and then you get song thrushes and missile thrushes the blackbirds just started to sing this week and then you gradually try and learn one at a time and then build it up from there and it, it does take years to actually learn all the bird songs but it is a really satisfying thing to be able to just wander around and actually hear the, hear the birds and know where which bird is is thinking about nesting where. Um, and as I said, there's lots of information online now, so it's uh, 
actually when I when I learned many years ago it was quite tricky really had to go out and find birds I remember hearing this bird singing and then I had to track it down and buy and see the bird I heard the song I saw the bird I see it was a black a male black cap as you get a bird which migrates down to the Mediterranean and comes back here in April time and then I could identify and I just learned them one at a time doing that. Uh, we did last year with the Be Wild uh, group, we, Robbie Phillips and I made a film of the, of the Dawn Chorus out at Henry Woods and various places around Buxley and that is available to uh, view and listen to online if you just have a look at that link there. Uh, the dual chorus is one of the most amazing things. You've got to get up early in the morning to to see it, really. And first, early May is the time to hear the dual chorus. But you've got to get up about four o'clock. The birds start start singing about half past four. Uh, but it is a fantastic thing to hear. It's one of the real wonders of nature, and it's you know, on our doorsteps. Now, the birds are singing because they're setting up territories to nest. Uh, some birds, like this song thrush, will start nesting quite early in the year. And they'll have two, sometimes three broods of young in, in a year. There's some young song thrushes ready to go. So these birds and blackbirds as well, will they, they will have two broods of young uh, in one year. But other birds, like the migrant birds, is a wood warbler, which flies winters down in Africa and then comes back to breed on in the woods around Dartmoor. Uh, but this would just have one brood of, of young. Now, a lot of the birds that breed on Dartmoor, you know, it's called a wood warbler, but it actually nests, it nests in woods, but it nests on the ground. And a lot of birds do nest on the ground. So it's actually just tucked away on a bank in the woods, just up near Bench Tall. This is well good for birds uh, this time of year. Uh, this is the River Dart near Buckfastley. And that's, uh, it's a torrent river. So it's one of the fastest rising rivers in, in the country. And that's it after a flood, the same view. And then it quickly goes down, but it's really, a, a really good river for um, birds like the dipper. Uh, this is the related to the thrushes, the dipper, related to blackbirds and things like that, but it actually is, feeds on rivers and it's the only bird that, passerine bird, that um, the perching bird, which feeds underwater. So it actually dives underwater and finds things like caddis fly, larvae, and things like that to feed on. Kingfishers as well. There again, they're another bird which. If you know their call, they make a real piping, high-pitched piping call, which is the first indication that they're present. Because although they're quite brightly coloured, they're actually quite cryptic, and they just sit very still on a, on a branch, and they can be quite tricky to see until they fly off, and you get this blaze of sapphire blue as they fly away. But they're not uncommon around the edges of Dartmoor. As is this bird, the goose sounder. The male and female there. And at this time, those were in Ivy Bridge uh, Woods last week, and uh, they're prospecting nest sites at this time of year. So the, uh, the female will actually nest like the male. She would nest in a hole in a tree, and there's a nest up in this tree here. I climbed up to see, and there's the female goosander on her nest. And then when the young go goosander ducklings come out, they uh, have to jump out of the tree. So they may be able to jump 10 meters out of the nest and jump onto the ground and then go down to the river and then they'll sit on their mum's, mum's back for a day or two before they get big enough to uh, fend for themselves. It's the goosander. Other birds again nest on the ground and this is one that's uh, a nocturnal bird, the nightjar. So to see these really active you've got to go out uh, to the, some of the plantations out on, to, on Dartmoor, places um, like Fernworthy, um, Susanstown, places like that. Uh, in in the summer and at dusk you might hear the strange churring call of the night jar that comes out to be but um, they, they don't, again they don't make, really make a nest as such they just nest on the ground and that's uh, a night jar with two chicks there you just see for one you know just one chick there incredibly camouflaged birds I'm just going to show you some of the special birds of Dartmoor now this is up Place I spend a lot of time up near Brentford Reservoir, up on the moor there. Uh, you get birds like the stone chat, familiar bird, and again, these nest down on the ground. So stone chats will raise two or three broods of young over the summer. Uh, and it's the male that, that um, sort of guards the territory, but it's the female that uh, sits on the nest. So she's much browner than the male and camouflage. So she's uh, camouflaged on the nest there. Uh, another bird, the wind chat. 
This is a close relative of the stone chat. This one flies up from Europe each year, uh, from Africa each year uh, to breed here. And again, the males are quite brightly coloured, uh, but the females are much more camouflaged. And again, they nest down on the ground there. So that's a, a wind chat female sat on a nest. Uh, they lay bright blue eggs, and these are the eggs just hatched. And uh, the, the young grow incredibly quickly. So after two weeks, uh, that's, the, that's those same young. They're growing into proper little birds and they're ready to fly off. And then they'll follow their parents around for a few more weeks and then they'll migrate down to somewhere in the middle of Africa to spend the winter. Quite amazing, really. Uh, another common bird on Dartmoor, the skylark. And again, that nests on the ground, superbly camouflaged. Uh, usually lays three eggs. And the chicks have feathers on, which look like grass. So they're incredibly camouflaged when the female is away from the nest. The, uh, cam when the female comes back, the adults come back to feed them, they come to life and they uh, feed the young. That's the skylark. And these are them just ready to go. They, they're in the nests again for just, just under two weeks before they fly. So they grow incredibly quickly. Another common bird, the meadow pipit. That's one of the commonest breeding birds in Dartmoor. Again, nests down on the ground. Uh, this one is the host of another bird, the cuckoo. Now, the cuckoo, as you know, lays its eggs in other birds' nests. So Dartmoor is now one of the real strongholds of cuckoos. They've declined incredibly over the last 50, 60 years. They used to be everywhere, cuckoos, but now you just find them in places like Dartmoor, um, and they're quite common here. Uh, they arrive in April time, April, May time, and they the females will seek out the nests of particularly meadow pipits on Dartmoor, and you see the cuckoo lays her egg in the meadow pipit's nest there, and you can see the, the egg there on the top left. And it's just slightly bigger than the meadow pipit's egg, but a very similar colour. And when the young cuckoo hatches, it ejects the eggs of the meadow pipit. So it actually pushes them out of the nest and takes over the nest so it can get all the food. Um, so the uh, it also has a call, which sounds like not just one baby bird, it sounds like a whole group of baby birds. It has a special call, so the adult uh, the meadow pipit parents will think there's lots of young in there, so they'll bring in lots of food for four or five chicks when there's just really one big fat cuckoo that gets all the food. And it has this super bright gape as well to uh, to hypnotise the meadow pipits into feeding it even more and more. Eventually it grows bigger than the pipits, but they don't seem to notice. Um, they've got this particularly big baby, and uh, this is uh, me in a, a little hide here. I've just set up a little hide on there's a meadow pipit nest just in front there. And I could just sit and watch it, watch the meadow pipit um, fly and feed this monster cuckoo. And then it would actually sit on my head after it, was, it would fly up and sit on top of my head after it fed the cuckoo and then fly up and find some more food for it. And it would just come in constantly with um, moths and caterpillars and all sorts of things to feed this monster bird. Eventually, it, the cuckoo left the nest and the pipit still follow it around. And eventually, they have to climb up its back to feed it. A little bit of video of this, I'll show you now. The cuckoo. They should be back. It's only a few weeks' time, really, before the cuckoos come back. I'll just finish off by showing you one of my favourite birds, the uh, long-tailed tit. This is a, a long-tailed tit's nest. Um, and they build. They start actually. They start building in the next week or so. They one of the earliest birds to start building the nest. So even though they're tiny birds, uh, they've got. They build very elaborate nests, and they usually start about the first of March. So the, the, each pair will collect spiders' webs and lichen, and they'll weave these together to make a beautiful dome-shaped nest. And when it's finished, uh, they will line it with feathers. So they'll collect hundreds of feathers and, line, and put them inside. So it's nice and snug and warm. And they build their nest early, so it's all ready for them to nest in sometime in April to when the weather warms up a bit. But they need to, because it takes so long, they need to get the nest built early so it's ready and ready for when the weather improves. And they lay the eggs in there and the, the young 
Uh, again, these birds just have one brood of chicks. So they uh, raise them in April time. And usually by sometime late April, early May, the chicks will fledge. And then these ones are just ready to go. And then they'll come out. And then they will actually stay with their parents. They're quite unusual, the long-tailed tits, because they stay with their parents right through the through the year until they build then their own nest again the following season. So right through the winter, you might see families. I showed you earlier the family on the uh, on the feeder. And these are likely to be the parent birds, plus they're young from last year and other relatives and all other birds which join them together. And you can get flocks of up to 19 or 20 birds which will um, survive over the winter. And they, they, the amazing thing that enables them to survive over the winter is that they snuggle up to keep warm at night. So I'll just finish off by showing you this video of the long-tailed tits forming their roost group. Now each long-tailed tit the most, the most dominant birds in the flock don't want to be on the ends because that's the coldest spot. So they have to, to get a nice warm, snug spot in the middle. So the young birds from last year will end up on the outside, but all the other birds, the more dominant adults, will, will get a nice warm, snug spot in the middle. And they'll settle down for the night eventually once they've had a few scraps about who's in the middle or not. They'll have a bit of a yawn and then they'll stay in that, that position over the night. Okay, well, well, thanks very much for listening and I'll answer some questions in a minute. If you'd like to have find any more information, have a look on my website, johnmortals.co.uk. Uh, thank you very much. We'll just come out of here and stop sharing. Hi, right, John. Thank you for that. That's good. I've... Uh... I'm just going to turn that microphone off as well so we should both be on uh, so that was a brilliant talk thank you for that uh, really fascinating lots of really interesting insights and a real uh, real clues as to sort of the dedication and patience you've got in terms of uh, getting out there but enough enough hints and tips to sort of excite us all I think to try and get out and start doing it ourselves as well uh, fabulous right uh, Alyssa here has a problem with uh, with rats she wants to put out uh, food for the birds um but uh she doesn't want to attract the rats have you got any idea of any rat proof feeders that she could perhaps use yeah i mean really if, yeah if you have trouble with rats obviously that is a problem um it's probably best to have if you if you make a bird table and actually put the, the food on a you know on a pole really and have you know have a table on top of a pole put some grease or something on the pole and the rats won't be able to climb up that. That would be one way to, that I do it. I mean, I luckily don't get a problem with rats here, but uh, you know, if you're living out in the country or in certain areas where you, you do get that problem, I would resort to, to doing something like that. Try, try and outwit them really. Um, it's the best way. Sure. We can outwit a rat. Yeah. <laughs> and just think of ways. If you again, it's down to observing them. Yeah. What, what do they do that they, they come out there, on the ground, so don't put food on the ground, uh, elevate it, and then you know they they try and climb up there. But if you make it greasy, you wouldn't be able to climb up a greasy pole, so a rat probably wouldn't be able to either. So that that would be what I would do to do that. Yeah, that's that's a great great idea, isn't it? And I think probably along with that, it's probably also about not putting too much food out there, only putting enough food for the birds out, so you don't end up with waste that goes all over and attracts the birds as well. Okay, that's brilliant. Uh, and also, she was also asking uh, another question, which probably I think a lot of people would be interested in, is um, is uh, how do we attract the birds into our gardens through the winter uh, in terms of what shrubs and trees might sort of attract them? So if we're thinking about gardening, what can we do to garden for wildlife? Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you've got feeders up, it is good to have some, some sort of, bush sort of fairly dense bush or a tree nearby do like a bit of cover and then they'll come in you know so a thick hedge um, we've got some honeysuckle and various sort of climbers and things like that that they can go into but any a thorn bush would be good something thorny and so birds can go in and you know if you get birds like sparrowhawks coming in or whatever they feel protected um, but also you know we've got I mean we didn't plant it we've got a Tony Aster tree just outside the, the window of my office here. That's it's covered in berries in the winter. 
character. So, you know, things like rowan trees and uh, toniasters, which have berries on in the wintertime, then they will attract birds into their feeders, but they will be attracted to your garden to feed on the berries. Yeah, that's good. I, I've been trying to make my garden more attractive. I think I'm in serious competition with all the neighbours who are trying to feed the birds. So I've got lots of lovely food out on, the, on my bird table and, and nice feeders and fat balls. But I'm only attracting one or two birds there. So I'm thinking, how can I up the ante with my garden to make it more more interesting? So, yeah, I've planted a hedge along the bottom of the garden to create more shrubs and things. Uh, yeah, so interesting. Uh, and see what sort of food your neighbours are putting out and put out something different. Um, you know, things like nigh seed is really for attracting yes. goldfinches, for instance. Um, live meat worms I put out for attracting robins. So if, if you've got different food, you you know the birds will find your you know, your site as a good stuff there, and maybe come in and feed you. We may get different birds there. Yeah. Also, leaving patches untidy. We've got a few weeds and things growing in our garden. There's a male bullfinch came down to feed on some weed seeds the other day, and some old teasel heads that we left out in the garden, and then the goldfinches came and fed on those. So. Yeah, it's uh, being a bit messy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we, we've definitely a bit messy in our garden as well. But, um, yeah, we're finding we're getting robins and dunnocks and blackbirds sort of as our main kind of birds coming in. But the blue tits and coal tits and great tits just, uh, you know, are, are passing us by. They've obviously got better food uh, somewhere else, I guess. They, they just got habitualised to another garden and that's their regular spot. And if there's plenty of food there, they don't go searching off anything yeah, anywhere else. So I think so. Um Okay, uh, I've got another question here from uh, from Bridget, and again, it's about feeders and things like that. So, um, any tips on cleaning feeders and things? We're worried about bird hygiene and things. Yeah, yeah, something I forgot to mention, Bridget. Uh, yeah, it's it is essential to every every week or two to clean your feeders, particularly if you've got little grilled things. And what I do is I just uh, get a bucket and uh, put some hot water in in a bucket with a detergent and just swill it around give it a scrub i've got an old toothbrush or something like that just give it a good scrub down uh, and clean it up that way and so uh, but yeah as you said it's it's good to keep keep the uh, the feeders clean because they there are birds like the green finch which have declined declined a lot because they caught a disease which was spread through uh, contact with uh, the feeders so you know it's a bit like coronavirus or it's social distancing and whatever and it's the other places which are where the, the social birds are going to pick up diseases so, yeah keep being clean and uh, but it's fairly straightforward really a bit of warm water and excellent, you know, excellent. Grease, that's, really. that's brilliant thank you for that so hopefully that's sorted i was just checking the uh, the questions then uh to make sure and there was just a whole endless uh a list of people who'd emailed in to say we couldn't hear you before so uh, i'm glad we sorted that out and uh, that'll teach me for being too clever with the buttons here on this side of things um okay uh so i've got i've just got a couple of questions that i'm going to ask you i think uh so so one comment i'm going to make uh, you mentioned about learning bird songs and, and learning one or two at a time and that's definitely how i've approached it and actually if you if you learn two or three you could maybe make them into a bit of a quiz with yourself and sort of like you know play them randomly and go right i think that one's the robin or that one's the blackbird so you could you could sort of work in your family and sort of try and do that and then actually to go out back into the wild and actually try and see if you can hear those birds you've just been learning the calls for that's yeah that seems to be the main thing uh, that i picked up on that yeah, I recommend really is um, first of all, if you're learning anything, try and find a friend who's learning as well. Because if you're learning with someone else, it's far easier because you sort of, you know, you bounce off each other, and one person learns something, and and, and it's far on a guided walks, uh, the national park with guided walks, thing, where you can actually go out with someone who can teach you some of the bird songs. And also in the winter time, there's lots of um, you know, a bird song online. So, because the birds aren't so limited, you might get a bit rusty, but you can listen to it over the winter when you're working and uh, actually think, oh, yeah, I can, that's a robin, that's a blackbird, and just keep it in your mind, really. 
So another thing I recommend. Yeah, because I find I find it really hard to actually hold the the tune of the bird in my in my head. So I, I'm able to sort of work on the the simpler birds, so things like the great tit, uh, which does yeah. make its kind of t- traditional teacher teacher kind of noise. I, I have in my mind yeah. that it's a that someone's bouncing around on a rusty pogo stick and it's going eh, 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 yeah. eh, eh, eh. Uh, and it's that's right. So yeah. to me, it's about sort of it's about trying to make that link. So that might be helpful for for anyone who's trying to get in. Is think what it sounds a bit like. Um, the blue tit sometimes sounds a bit like a little little petrol engine just about to start. It seems to go did 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anything like that, yeah, that you yeah. you can do and just fix it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's, yeah, it is fixing it in your mind, isn't it? Okay. Uh, right, I, I think we've covered lots of things. Uh, I haven't seen any new questions in the uh, in the emails, so uh, I'm just going to wrap it up by uh, by asking you, uh, John. A lot of your time is going to be spent sat out uh, in the open, sort of trying to uh, keep warm and, and still while you're watching things, because I think a lot of this is about being still, isn't it? And and actually just sort of being patient and waiting for things to happen. So. Um, I just wondered what's your favourite snack to take along with you uh, while you're out and about, your favourite snack to keep you nice and warm? I usually have lots of oatcakes actually in the bag because they, because it is actually quite, it's amazing how tiring you get. And I cycle around as well. So I always keep a few oatcakes tucked in the top of a bag. So when I get hungry, (laughs) that's why it's staple diet out out and about because they're lightweight. And uh, they, they'll sit in there for a week if they need to, but they don't usually Fabulous. last that long. That's great. Well, thank you, John, for uh, for sharing all your knowledge with us today. Uh, it's been fantastic. There have been lots of people saying they've, they've enjoyed it, uh, uh, really enjoyed it. Looking forward to seeing it again uh, on YouTube later. Uh, and hopefully we'll share this with, with more people as well. So thank you for giving it your time today. It's been uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, it just makes me want to sort of finish work early now and uh, get out there and uh, do a bit more bird watching. Uh, so uh, thank you, thank you. Um, been lovely to have you with us. Um, and uh, just uh, for everyone else, uh, we have. Uh, I think that's probably all our activities for the uh, for our bird week this week. So you've still got time to go and make your bird feeder pancakes. You've still got time to go and make your bird. Uh, your nest box uh, using Stuart's video Uh, and as John says there's loads of great resources online to go and uh, research and look at as well so learn all your bird calls get into it Uh, start doing your paintings as well and things like that that's been a really uh, a good way of sort of getting you to observe and see things a bit more closely as well so thank you to all of you for coming along today thank you to John Um, it all that relays All it leaves me to do now is to uh, wish you all uh, a great week and to say goodbye. And uh, I'll thank you all and I'll end the broadcast now. Take care, everyone. All the best.